Bonjour à tous. Good afternoon or good evening or good morning, depending where you are in the world right now watching this session. My name is Fabrice Marangana. I'm the director of the Center for Interdisciplinary Research, Music, Media and Technology, Kermit. And it's our pleasure to co-host with ISPS the talk and the keynote by Nadia Ada, uh, who will present her research uh, on drummers. Um, uh, it's great pleasure to be the co-host and with this great work and I would like to thank a lot Isabel Cosset and Aaron Williamon who have been working tirelessly to be able to present this conference despite all the hurdles that were thrown in their way. Nadia Azar is a professor of biomechanics and ergonomics at the University of Windsor in Ontario. Her primary background is in and research training are in occupational biomechanics and biome biomedical engineering with concentrations in biomechanics and neurophysiology. She had a bachelor and master's degree in human kinetics at the University of Windsor, and then she pursued a master in science and PhD in biomechanical engineering at the Wayne State University, where she learned how to do automotive crashes with dummies, which is pretty cool. And Later on, she went to working with drummers. I'm not sure what's the relationship with dummies and drummers, but that's for another story. She's the founder and director of the Drummer Mechanics and Ergonomics Research Lab, which has the coolest name ever, Drummer Lab. And her research goal is of all uh, to, go, to do for drummers what sports science is doing for athletes, which is to help them achieve their peak performance while reducing their risk of injuries. She has, of course, many publications and grants, and she attracted lots of attention from the large media, CTV News, CBC Radio, etc., for her research. And without further ado, Nadia, the mic is yours. Well, merci beaucoup, Fabrice, and uh, thank you very much, everyone, for coming today, and especially thank you to Fabrice and Kermit and the ISPS Organizing Committee for inviting me to come here to present to you today. I'm truly honored to be here. So as Fabrice mentioned, I am the founder and the director of the Drummer Lab at the University of Windsor. And our lab studies the physical demands of playing the drum set, and we use two different perspectives to do this. One is drummers as athletes, and the other is drumming as an occupation. So Fabrice mentioned that our overall goal is we're trying to do for drummers what sports science has done for athletes, which is to help them to achieve their peak performance. So becoming an elite performer at any task takes years of intensive preparation. And when I was preparing this presentation, I was reflecting on what it takes to become an elite performer and the amount of preparation that goes into it. And it seemed to me that there were four domains of preparation. So the first one, and maybe the most obvious, is task-specific skill development. So to be an expert at anything, you have to be highly trained and skilled at that task to be able to give a good performance. And this is where most people would spend, who are working towards becoming an expert, uh, in any skill would spend most of their time, and rightly so. Um, but there are three other domains where I believe preparation in these areas will help push people from being highly skilled into being truly elite. So one of these is mental skills training. And so this is where people would learn how to handle the psychological demands of the task. So for example, learning how to manage performance anxiety or how to enhance focus and filter out distractions in the environment in which the performance is going to take place. Physical conditioning is the third area, and this is where people work on developing the physical capacity to perform a task through specialized training programs such as strength and conditioning or endurance training. And the last domain is injury prevention. And so this is where people would spend time to take steps to identify and manage the risks associated, uh, or the risks of injury that are associated with the task. So unfortunately, through my research, I've come to see that many drummers overlook these last two domains in particular. But these domains have the potential to have a huge impact on drumming performance. Playing the drums is a physically demanding task, and if drummers don't prepare their bodies 
by developing the capacity to handle those demands, they won't be able to deliver their best possible performance. They could also be putting themselves at risk of developing a playing-related musculoskeletal disorder. If a person's injured, they're not going to be able to give their best performance. And if the injury is severe enough, they might not be able to perform at all. So all of these areas of preparation contribute to the ability to deliver an optimal or a peak performance. But it's these last two aspects that I would like to focus on today. So for the rest of this presentation, I'm going to highlight the research that demonstrates the importance of physical conditioning and injury prevention for drummers. I'll start by describing the research that demonstrates the intense cardiovascular demands associated with live drumming performance, which will speak to the importance of physical conditioning. From there, I'll describe the research that demonstrates that playing-related musculoskeletal disorders, or PRMDs for short, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, are that these are a significant health issue for drummers and that this issue needs further consideration. So I will describe the research showing the rates and patterns of PRMDs in drummers. And I will talk about the research that the Drummer Lab has been doing so far uh, to describe the mechanisms of injury for the two most commonly reported PRMDs. I'll also discuss the role of education as a strategy to reduce the risk of developing PRMDs and the steps we are taking to work towards making it easier for drum set instructors to be able to include injury prevention within their curricula. And then finally, I'll wrap up with some concluding remarks and then we will open up for questions. So before I go into the reasons why I believe drummers should be engaging in physical conditioning, I wanted to give you some of the backstory for how I got into this kind of work. So I'm a professor of kinesiology, which is the study of human movement. Some of us study high performance athletes, whereas others study skill development across the lifespan. Still others study movement in occupational settings or in rehabilitation. So how did I end up studying drummers? Well, about five years ago, I was at a Dream Theater concert, and we had fantastic seats, so I was able to watch their drummer, Mike Mangini, pretty closely during the show. And I thought to myself how much fun it would be if I could somehow manage to get him to come to my lab, and I could hook him up to all my research equipment, and see what his muscle activation patterns and his movement patterns were, which admittedly is a very nerdy thing to be thinking about in the middle of a rock concert. But as it happened, a few days later, Mike tweeted this. The technique that I've worked so hard for keeps me free from pain. Being sore from drumming uh, is from drumming being such a boxing match type of workout. And at the time, I wasn't really big on interacting on social media, but I saw this and I thought to myself, this is too good to pass up. I have to, I have to say something. So I tweeted back to him that I was a professor and a researcher and that I would love to do a study of his technique and to message me if he was interested thinking, you know, maybe he'll give it a like and then move on with his day. But he actually tweeted back and messaged me. And after a few direct messages and a Skype conversation, I came away with several ideas for research studies that I thought would be really interesting and fun. So given that a big part of my education and training is in ergonomics and injury prevention, I decided to start there. Now, a few months later, as I was working on developing those studies, Mike took to Twitter again, this time musing about how many calories he burns during a show. And he gave an estimate based on some uh, studies of energy expenditure that have been done, uh, energy expenditure during drumming. One of the studies that he was referring to was by the Klemberg Drumming Project. So about 10 years ago, a group of researchers in the UK got together with Klemberg, who was the drummer for Blondie, to revisit the concept of energy expenditure from during drumming. Early studies had reported uh, drummers' energy expenditures to be around four metabolic equivalents, which is about four times the energy cost of sitting quietly. And this would be considered a moderate intensity activity. The problem is the participants in those studies were orchestral percussionists from the 1920s. So this is a very different style of drumming from modern rock, pop, and metal drumming. So this group monitored Clem's heart rate during live performances and related that to data that they obtained in their lab during a ramp cycle ergometer test to exhaustion to estimate his energy expenditure from the shows. 
And they did the same with another 14 professional and semi-professional drummers, and they reported that uh, and they found an average energy expenditure of about 620 calories per hour. And from the heart rate data, they concluded that drumming was an intermittent activity which required the use of both the anaerobic and aerobic energy systems. So when I saw Mike's most recent tweet, I immediately messaged him and said that we could do something similar if he was interested to get actual data on himself instead of having to estimate with some equipment that I had in my lab. And so he was into it and we made plans for him to wear the devices during two of his shows on their upcoming tour. And here's what we found. So Dream Theater played the exact same set list at both of the shows. The first set was a mix of songs. The second set was their images and words album from start to finish, because that's what they were celebrating on this tour. And the encore was a 23 minute song called A Change of Seasons. The total playing time for each show was about two and a half hours. On average, Mike used about 614 calories to get through images and words, and 193 calories to play through a change of seasons. His total energy expenditure averaged across both shows, including both sets and the encore, was about 1,338 calories. His average energy expenditure for each show, or average rate of energy expenditure for each show, was a little over eight calories per minute. Now around the same time, Jeff Burroughs heard about what Mike and I were doing and he wanted to get involved as well. Jeff is the drummer for the Canadian rock band, The Tea Party, and they had a residency coming up in Toronto a couple weeks after Mike's shows. So Jeff and I made plans for him to wear the armbands during two of those shows and here's what we found for his data. Each of their shows included two sets and an encore and the band was featuring a different album at each show. Jeff used about 690 calories to play through the transmission album and about 730 calories to play through the Edges of Twilight album. His total energy expenditure averaged across the two shows was about 1,378 calories and his average rate of energy expenditure was a little over eight calories per minute. So it's been about four years since I collected the data on Mike and Jeff, and after they did the study, there was a ton of interest. And so up to now, I've had 40 professional drummers who have participated in the study, including Jeff and Mike themselves. Uh, the average age of the participants was 42 years. Rock and metal was the most common musical genre, but pop, country, and musical theater were represented as well. The performances were held in a variety of different settings, including clubs, theaters, arenas, and outdoor venues, both in the winter and in the summer. The average duration of the performances was about 76 minutes. So a few months into the study, I decided to add to the protocol uh, by using heart rate monitors to measure heart rate during the shows as well. So I have energy expenditure data for 39 participants and heart rate data for 29 participants. For those participants, the average rate of energy expenditure was 10 calories per minute. So to put this into context, for a person whose body mass is 68 kilograms, this rate of energy expenditure is comparable to what they would expend during a moderate intensity session on a stationary rower or a stationary bike. The average heart rate across the 29 participants was 144 beats per minute and the average peak heart rate was 175 beats per minute. So again, to provide some context, the typical resting heart rate for a healthy adult is between 60 and 100 beats per minute. So these values are well above resting heart rate. But if you wanna get a sense of how hard someone is working based on their heart rate, you have to compare it to uh, the heart rate during the task to their maximum heart rate. And measuring max heart rate directly requires those tests to exhaustion that I mentioned earlier. And those tests have to be done in a lab, which wasn't really going to be possible with this participant group. So what I did instead was I estimated their maximum heart rate using uh, this equation for age predicted max heart rate, or I identified the peak heart rate that was recorded throughout the show, and I used whichever one was highest. Once I had that number, I expressed their heart rates from the shows as a percentage of that maximum number. And then I calculated how much time they spent within each of these five exercise intensity categories as defined by the American College of Sports Medicine. 
On average, the participants spent 83% of their time during the performances with their heart rates at or above 64% of their max heart rate, which is defined as moderate, vigorous, or at or near maximal intensity. The Canadian Society for Exercise Physiology and the American College of Sports Medicine both recommend that healthy adults get at least 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity exercise per week. So if the average show duration for my participants was 76 minutes and they were spending 83% of their show time at or above a moderate intensity, then they could easily meet or exceed this recommendation while they are out on tour. So it's clear that drumming can be a high intensity activity and this graph I feel puts it in perspective really nicely. So each of the red bars, whoops, each of the red bars is, uh, it represents one um, participant's average heart rate expressed as a percent of their maximum. The group's average heart rate in terms, uh, in absolute terms was 144 beats per minute, which when you average out their max or their, their um, average heart rate as a percent of their maximum, it worked out to about 79% of max heart rate. Compare that to the average heart rate of a group of professional soccer players during competitive match play, which was 86% maximum heart rate. So these data clearly show that playing the drums is a high intensity and intermittent activity. And this is important for a few reasons, but for professional drummers in particular, these data show that they are likely to exceed this recommendation uh, while they, or the, the recommended exercise targets while they're out on tour, which is actually a good thing because it means they're staying fit, they're meeting those, those targets. But because they perform at such a high intensity and so often while they're out on tour, this data to me says that professional drummers need to be considering or should be considering to engage in cardiovascular endurance and high intensity interval training to prepare their bodies to handle the physical demands of their profession in order to be able to deliver their peak performance. Now, unfortunately, this is an area that is overlooked by many drummers, and this is problematic because physical conditioning is not only important for achieving peak performance, it is also an important component of injury prevention. So as I mentioned previously, uh, given that a big part of my education and training is in ergonomics and injury prevention, I had decided that originally that this was where I was going to start uh, getting into this area of research. So at the same time that the energy expenditure study was happening, I was also looking into research about drumming related injuries. Now in general, injuries happen because the demands that are placed on a person exceed that person's capacity to meet those demands. The greater the demands and the lower the capacity, the greater the risk that an injury will occur. Injuries can manifest in one of two ways. Acute injuries are the result of a single event that loads a tissue beyond its capacity and results in an injury. So an example would be if you were to slip on an icy sidewalk and fracture your wrist while breaking your fall. That fracture happens because the, the force that's applied to your bone during the fall is higher than the maximum force that that bone can handle, and so it fractures. Chronic injuries, on the other hand, uh, are the result of repeated lower level loading that wears down the tissue so that over time, the tissue's capacity to handle the load is reduced to the point where a load that was once acceptable is no longer tolerated and an injury occurs. So stress fractures are a good example of a chronic injury. They develop over time from repeated impacts with the ground, especially when you run on hard surfaces like concrete. Playing-related musculoskeletal disorders, or PRMDs, fall into that latter category. PRMDs develop over time as a direct result of playing an instrument and they interfere with the musician's ability to play their instrument at the level to which they are accustomed. Some examples include tendinitis, carpal tunnel syndrome, bursitis, and low back pain. Now, you've all likely heard of at least one drummer who faced a potentially career-ending PRMD, and these were the drumming-related injuries that I was most interested in. But when I started reviewing the literature, I very quickly found that there was very little research on PRMDs in percussionists in general, let alone on drummers specifically. 
Based on the best available literature at the time, the lifetime prevalence of PRMDs in percussionists, including drummers, was somewhere between 74 to 77%. And the upper limbs and the low back tended to be affected the most. Now, the results of these two studies and many of the other previous studies are difficult to apply to drummers specifically for a variety of reasons, uh, such as the studies used mixed percussion groups, um, small sample sizes, or the lack of inclusion of diverse musical genres. Now, many of the risk factors for developing PRMDs are probably common to all percussionists, but the rates and the injury patterns in drummers may differ due to differences in the physical demands on drummers compared to other percussionists and within drummers who play different styles of music. So I designed a study that would try to address some of these limitations. And the goal of the study was to determine the rates and the injury patterns of PRMDs specifically in drummers and to identify the characteristics that might put drummers at risk for or protect them from developing PRMDs. To collect the data, I developed an electronic survey that included three types of questions. The first section asked about respondent characteristics like age, gender, and years of playing experience. The second section asked participants about their experiences with PRMDs, such as their injury history, what their pain levels were, how much the injury interfered with their ability to play, things like that. The section also included a body map so that participants could tell me which body parts were affected by the injury. And it also contained a question asking them to list the medical diagnosis they had received, if any. The third section of the survey asked a series of questions about drumming and lifestyle-related characteristics, such as practice and performance habits, and how often they engaged in warm-ups, cool-downs, and exercise. The survey was distributed through social media and online for a period of three months. During that time, I received 862 responses from drummers from around the world and 831 of them provided usable data. Canada, the United States, and Europe were the countries that had the most representation, but there was representation from every continent except Antarctica. 90% of the participants self-identified as being male, and the average age was 40 years. The data were analyzed using qualitative or quantitative methods uh, where appropriate, and here's what I found. <clears throat> 68% of the respondents reported that they had experienced a PRMD at some point during their playing lifetimes, which is a little lower, but still pretty consistent with the previous studies. The respondents also reported similar body regions where PRMDs developed, particularly the upper limbs and the back, and with the wrists and the low back being the most frequently cited specific locations where the injuries occurred. 23% of the respondents reported that they had experienced a PRMD within the seven days leading up to them completing the survey. These respondents were also asked to rate how much the PRMD was interfering with various aspects of their playing and their daily lives, and the average score was a 5 out of 10, which indicates a moderate level of interference. Which may not seem like that strong of a rating, but when you consider the high stakes that are involved in a career as a musician, a moderate degree of interference is still a cause for concern in my mind. Another alarming finding was that 59% of the respondents reported that they had experienced more than one PRMD in their lifetime. Also, only 42% of them had received a diagnosis from a medical professional. The two most common diagnoses were tendinitis and carpal tunnel syndrome. So this first analysis of the survey data confirmed that PRMDs are a significant health concern for drummers. And it's compounded by the lack of extended healthcare benefits. Most of the survey respondents reported that they do not have these benefits or they get them through other employment besides drumming. So without those benefits, PRMDs could be particularly burdensome because the drummers would have to pay for the costs of dealing with those injuries out of pocket, especially in countries without socialized medicine. So this highlights the importance of determining the risk and protective factors for these injuries to try to reduce their burden. The data also clearly showed that the upper limbs were where most of the problems were occurring and that the most common injuries were tendonitis and carpal tunnel syndrome. So this first analysis gave us the roadmap for additional studies to examine the potential risk factors for PRMDs in more depth. <clears throat>
And since the upper limb was affected the most often and the two most common injuries share many of the same biomechanical risk factors, this is where my graduate students and I decided to start. So if we want to reduce our risk of getting injured, we need to reduce the demands being placed on our bodies or increase our capacity to handle those demands. Ideally, we would do both of those things. When you engage in physical conditioning, such as endurance and strength training, over time you will increase your body's capacity to handle the demands being placed on it and you reduce your risk of getting injured. However, physical conditioning alone is not enough to prevent an injury from happening. You also have to take steps to reduce the demands of the task to a level that is within your capacity to handle. To do that, you need to identify the demands that are contributing to the risk of injury. These demands or risk factors can be grouped into four categories, biomechanical, psychosocial, environmental, and individual. All of these are important contributors to the development of PRMDs, but the Drummer Lab's research focuses on the biomechanical risk factors, which are the mechanical demands that are placed on the body that increase one's risk of injury, such as high forces, repetitive movements, awkward postures, and vibration exposure. So in the case of tendonitis and carpal tunnel syndrome, both of these injuries are associated with uh, forceful exertions, repetitive movements, and non-neutral postures, especially when they occur in combination, which they often do. Carpal tunnel syndrome has also been associated with exposure to hand-arm vibration. So before I start this video, just a warning that it does contain some mild strobe lighting. So I'll just give a second if you need to avert your eyes or blank your screen for a minute before I start it. Okay, so for drummers, the levels of exposures to each of those risk factors may differ between different musical genres, but you can clearly see that there could be exposures to all four of them. The source of repetitive motions involved in drumming is obvious. Drumming is, by very nature, a rhythmic and repetitive task. Forceful exertions occur when striking the drums and cymbals, especially for louder dynamics, as well as through constant engagement of the forearm muscles and tendons and the small muscles within the hand for gripping the sticks. Non-neutral postures can occur due to the placement of the various components of the drum set. For example, when reaching for drums or cymbals that are on the outer edges of the drummer's reach envelope. Exposure to hand-arm vibration comes from striking the drum set. The impact sends vibrations through the stick, which are transmitted to the hands and then can travel up the arms. Now, although there have been a few studies that have documented the forces and the movements associated with drumming, no one has examined this data in the context of injury prevention. And only one study has examined drummers' exposures to hand-arm vibration. So this is when one area where the Drummer Lab is working to fill the gap. A few years ago, my student, Jessica, used 3D motion capture to document the movement patterns of drummers' upper limbs while playing. 11 drummers participated in her study, nine of whom yielded usable data. Once the drummers were instrumented with the inertial, uh, uh, the IMUs, the inertial motion units, um, they played four songs in random order. Three of the songs were predetermined by the research group for the purpose of standardization, and one was chosen by the participants to represent their typical playing style. Jessica then extracted the joint angle time histories for the primary axes of rotation for the shoulder, elbow, and wrist joints bilaterally. And then she calculated the total ranges of motion, the average minimum and maximum joint angles, and the percentage of time of playing time spent in non-neutral joint postures for each standardized song individually and all three songs combined. So one of the more surprising findings that came out of Jessica's study was how much time the drummers spent not only with their wrists outside of neutral postures, but with their wrists extended. This graph shows the flexion and extension posture of one drummer's right hand over the course of playing a single song that was about three minutes long. The horizontal axis represents time and the vertical axis represents the wrist joint posture. The positive values represent wrist flexion and the negative values represent wrist extension. 
you can clearly see that the drummer spent most of the song with their wrist in extension. And as a group, the drummers spend about 96% of their time with their wrists extended. Now, the area between these two dotted lines is the range of wrist flexion and extension angles that we would consider to be a neutral wrist posture. And the shaded yellow areas are what we would consider mildly non-neutral. As you can see, this drummer spent a substantial amount of time with their wrists extended well beyond that range. Um, clearly in the territory that we would consider non-neutral or even extreme. As a group, the drummers spend about 90% of their time with their wrists in non-neutral posture. And we saw similar patterns for lateral deviation of the wrists, as well as for some shoulder movements. So these data suggested that non-neutral postures are likely to be contributing factors for the tendonitis and carpal tunnel syndrome that has been reported in drummers. Now, repetition is obviously a huge part of playing the drums, and we really did not need a research study to tell us that drumming involves repetitive movements. But the data that Jess collected also really highlighted the presence of repetitive movements, especially at the wrists. Each peak and valley on this graph indicates a change in the direction of the flexion extension motion at the wrist. And this is just for one three minute song. So imagine that all those changes of direction, all those wrist flexion and extensions over the course of a 45 minute practice or an hour long show. It's a lot of repetition. So rep repetitive movements, especially when coupled with non-neutral postures, are also likely to be a significant contributor to the development of tendonitis and carpal tunnel syndrome in drummers. Now, as I mentioned, there is one research group that measured the vibrations in drummers' hands while they were playing. But the study was limited by a small sample size and by a short data collection time. The authors only monitored drummers for about three minutes, and they also didn't specify whether the drummers in their study were playing an actual song or if they were just repeating a pattern over and over. So another of my grad students, Dylan, is building on this study by monitoring the vibrations at the hands of drummers over more prolonged playing periods. So the drummers in his study are instrumented with an accelerometer to capture the vibrations at the hands. They then play three songs of their choosing that represent their typical playing style. When he analyzes the data, he will extrapolate the numbers uh, based on their self-reported daily playing time. And then he will compare those numbers to recognized industrial standards for hand arm vibration exposure. Now, Dylan is currently in the process of analyzing this data, so I don't have the full results to present to you today. But here is one graph that shows the vibration exposure for one of his participants over the course of one song. So the horizontal axis for this graph, again, represents time. And the vertical axis represents the magnitude of the vibration recorded at the participant's left hand. So this was for a right-handed drummer playing closed-handed. So this is the vibration in his snare hand. The overall magnitude of the vibration for this song was about 21 meters per second squared. And its extrapolated value approaches the threshold where if this vibration profile was recorded in an industrial task, the company would have to start putting standards and regulations into place to protect the workers from the vibration exposure. So this data is only from a single participant and from one single song. But if the rest of the data from his study looks like this, and based on what we've seen so far, I suspect that it does, it demonstrates that the vibrations that drummers experience while playing are significant and are likely to play a role in the development of carpal tunnel syndrome. So we've identified the major risk factors for the two most common PRMDs reported in drummers, and there is evidence that drummers are exposed to at least three of them at levels that carry a higher risk of leading to a PRMD. So what can we do about that? There are several steps that can be taken to reduce exposures to these risk factors, even if you can't completely eliminate them. I just gave a workshop on this yesterday, so I won't go into great detail about that here, but I'll use repetitive motion as one example. So it's not possible to eliminate repetitive motion from drumming, but it is possible to reduce the influence of the repetitive motions by introducing breaks, 
So for example, setting a timer to remind yourself to take breaks uh, during a long practice session. Or you could also rotate which elements you're working on. So for example, work on hand movements for a while, then switch to footwork and back again. So while you're working on your hand movements, your feet or your leg muscles are getting a rest. And while you're working on your footwork, your upper limbs are getting a rest. Okay, so even though you're not, you're still playing, you're just using different muscle groups and so the other groups are resting. During performances, it's really difficult to take true breaks, um, but you can make use of the pauses in between songs or the periods during the songs where there is no percussion to take micro breaks. So the best time to implement these kinds of steps is before an injury develops instead of trying to deal with it reactively. This means that drummers need to learn about injury prevention early in their drumming careers. And this is where drum educators come in. So in theory, if drum educators included PRMD prevention in their curricula, it might encourage their students to engage in risk reduction behaviors, which in turn could reduce their rates of reporting PRMDs or at least the severity of the symptoms. And there is evidence that health promotion and injury prevention programming within university or college level uh, instrumental music programs can have a positive impact on musicians' knowledge and attitudes towards health and engagement in healthy behaviors, and that it can result in reduced frequency and severity of experiencing symptoms of PRMDs. Now, those previous studies were not specific to drum set education, but a second analysis of the data from my survey indicated that this might be the case for drummers too. For this analysis, I separated the survey respondents into groups based on whether they had received injury prevention education during their formal drum set training. So I use a couple of acronyms here just because injury prevention education is quite a mouthful. So PREV-ED represents participants that did receive injury prevention uh, education, and no PREV-ED represents those that did not. I then compared the rates of reporting both lifetime and current PRMDs between those two groups, and I calculated the odds ratios to get a sense of the magnitude of the effect. 81% of the drummers who uh, responded to the survey reported that they had received formal training on the drums, but only 42% of them, of that group, who, ha uh, who had received formal training reported that they had learned anything about injury prevention from their instructors. Within the PREVED group, the proportion who reported a lifetime history of PRMD was significantly smaller than the proportion who reported no lifetime history of PRMD. The opposite trend was observed in the no PREVED group. The proportion who reported a lifetime history of PRMD was significantly larger than the proportion who reported no lifetime history. The odds ratio showed that drummers who had not received injury prevention education were about twice as likely to report a lifetime history of PRMD. The same trend was observed in the respondents who reported that they were currently experiencing a PRMD. And in that case, the odds ratio again showed that drummers who had not received injury prevention were almost twice as likely to report that they were currently experiencing a PRMD. Now, the no preved group also included drummers who had received formal training. And one could make the case that drummers who received formal training would have been trained in the use of proper technique, posture, movement qualities, things like that. So even if the emphasis was not specifically on PRMD prevention, this kind of training may have had that effect. So to account for the potential effect of formal training, I separated the respondents in that no prev ed group into three subgroups. So one group had received formal training but was not taught about injury prevention. One group had received formal training but they reported that they weren't sure if they had received injury prevention. And one group uh, had had no formal training or they didn't respond to that question. When I reran the analysis, I found that the trend held. So in the group that had received formal training but did not get PREVED, the proportion who reported a lifetime history of PRMD was significantly larger than the proportion who reported no lifetime history. The trend also held for those reporting a current PRMD. 
So another interesting finding from this analysis was that the drummers who had received injury prevention education reported engaging in warm-ups, cool-downs, and exercise significantly more often than respondents who had not received injury prevention education. So what this data tells us is that formal lessons alone might not be enough to reduce the rates of PRMDs in drummers. It looks like we need educators to specifically address injury prevention with their students if we want to have a substantial impact on the rates at which drummers are reporting PRMDs. Now, there are some limitations to that study that do need to be taken into consideration when interpreting these data. So first is that this is a cross-sectional study, and I cannot infer that the injury prevention education was the cause of the lower rates of reporting PRMDs in that group. However, previous research that employed longitudinal cohort designs have demonstrated improvements in playing-related pain and other symptoms in undergraduate music students who completed semester-long courses on health promotion or injury. So it's quite possible that this would also be the case for drummers. Another limitation occurred with the interpretation of the participants' responses to a question asking them to describe what they were taught about injury prevention. I was able to group their responses into various themes and categories, but many of the actual responses that I got were too vague or generic to really understand what exactly they were taught. For example, one participant simply stated, stretching. So the thing is, the, the type of stretching that you do combined with the timing and the duration of the stretches has implications for both performance and injury prevention. So even respondents who do regularly engage in these activities may not experience lower rates of reporting PRMDs or lower levels of pain or interference if they're not engaging in the optimal forms of injury prevention behaviors. Further to that point, the respondents who reported learning about injury prevention were less likely to report a history of PRMD, but when you look at the rates of reporting PRMDs between the two groups, they were still high. So even though um, they engaged in injury prevention behaviors more often than the other groups, the group that had undergone or had received injury prevention education still didn't really engage in those behaviors all that often. They reported that they warmed up before playing about half the time, that they cooled down after playing sometimes or never, and that they engage in exercise less than one hour per week. So this suggests that drummers might not be engaging in these behaviors often enough, or they might not be optimizing how they engage in those behaviors to get the most benefit from them. So injury prevention education alone might not be the magic bullet for reducing the rates of PRMDs and drummers, but research certainly suggests that it can have an impact beyond that of formal training alone. So it's worth exploring ways to integrate injury prevention into drum set curricula more often and more effectively. I was really intrigued by the fact that so few of the survey respondents reported that they had learned about injury prevention from their instructors. Granted, musician wellness and occupational health is a fairly new field, but the recommendations to include this within music education have been around for at least two decades now. So there appears to be a gap between what can be considered best practice and what is occurring in actual practice. The reasons for that gap are currently unknown, and this is the next step in the Drummer Lab research plan. We need to identify the barriers and facilitators to including injury prevention education within drum set curricula. We recently received funding from the Grammy Museum to interview about 30 drum educators about the reasons why they do or don't teach their students about injury prevention and what resources are available or are needed to help them incorporate this into their teaching. So this work will guide the creation of resources and strategies that will empower these educators to develop or enhance this aspect of their curricula. And over time, we're expecting that as more and more schools, programs, and educators begin including injury prevention education in their curricula, we will start to see a reduction in the rates of reporting PRMDs and in the burden of these injuries from both economic and quality of life perspectives. So just to summarize, playing the drums is a physically demanding task and physical conditioning to handle the demands is essential. PRMDs are very common in drummers and particularly in the wrists and the low back. 
the two most commonly reported medical diagnoses for these injuries are tendinitis and carpal tunnel syndrome. And we are starting to accumulate research evidence to show that the known risk factors for these two injuries are present in drumming at levels that could lead to their development. Injury prevention education taught by drum instructors shows promise as a strategy to prevent these injuries from occurring, but we need to learn more about the reasons why drum educators do or don't include it in their teaching and what resources they might need to be able to do so in order to maximize the potential of this strategy to reduce the burden of these injuries in drummers. So at the beginning of this presentation, I talked about four domains of preparation to achieve elite performance. Task-specific skill development is an obvious requirement and is the domain where drummers spend most of their time. I didn't cover mental skills training as this is outside of my own expertise, but anyone who has ever performed in front of an audience uh, of any kind can appreciate the importance of preparing for the mental challenges of delivering a great performance. Throughout this presentation, I've discussed research that demonstrates the importance of engaging in physical conditioning and injury prevention to optimize performance. These two domains complement each other because physical conditioning is an important component of injury prevention. If we want to reduce our risk of being injured, we need to reduce the demands being placed on our bodies and increase our capacity to handle those demands. When you engage in physical conditioning, like endurance and strength training, over time, you increase your body's capacity to handle the demands being placed on it. When you take steps to reduce your exposures to risk factors for developing PRMDs, such as taking breaks to give your body a chance to recover from repetitive movements, you reduce the demands being placed on your body while you're playing. When you include both physical conditioning and injury prevention within your overall preparation regimen, you maximize your potential to deliver your best performance. So the Drummer Lab has come a long way and accomplished a lot in a very short period of time. And we wouldn't have been able to do it without the contributions of many, many people and organizations. There are way too many of them to fit on one slide, but I particularly want to thank my funding sources, uh, the people who have provided in-kind support for our work, uh, my department administrators and my colleagues for supporting our work and being very gracious about the noise coming from our non-soundproofed lab, especially when they're teaching and my grad students for coming along on this ride with me, and of course, uh, my family for their support and encouragement. <clears throat> so for the sake of the recording, I'm gonna flip through a couple slides with my references and image sources. And that's it. Thank you very much again for attending today, and I'd love to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia, for this excellent and great talk. And I just learned that going to the bar for a good beer after a show is not the best way to reduce risk. <laughs> Too sad. <Hopefully> not. <laughs> um, so I will take questions and repeat them in the mic so people who are at home uh, can hear them. Is there any question? And I will check on the Zoom also to see if there are any questions in the chat. Isabel, you're checking. Okay. Is there any question? I have one to start with. Um, when you did your survey, I'm wondering if people responded, uh, were responding because they were already experiencing PRMDs, and it, do you have a sense of uh, kind of over uh, rate of responses from people who are injured or who were injured versus the normal body of percussionists or drummers? Yeah, so that, that is certainly a possibility that there was response bias, and that's acknowledged in all the other survey studies that I talked about as well. Um, people who are already experiencing the issue might be more motivated to respond to a survey about a particular issue. Um, but because my numbers were very similar to previous studies, um, I feel like the bias, w I, I'm sure it was still there, but at least it seems like it was on par with other groups who have done similar studies with other musicians. Um, but because of the way the study recruitment proceeded, it was, it was online, it was snowball sampling. I don't have a sense of, I can't calculate a response rate because I don't know how many people saw it and chose not to respond. I did 
try to, uh, when I was promoting it, to say, like, even if you've never experienced an injury, I want to hear from you, uh, knowing that this was probably going to happen, but I, I don't have a way to quantify that. Thank you. Yes, uh, John. So I would just repeat the question for people at home. Oh, sure, so yeah. it's a question from one of our drum professor here, John Hollenbeck, uh, in the jazz department, and he was wondering, you know, where to go uh, to get, as a teacher and as a drummer, to get some, you know, uh, ergonomics knowledge and, and, and help on prevention and things like that. Absolutely. Um, so I, as I said yesterday, I did a workshop um, where we talked about injury prevention and strategies to incorporate. And I would like to do more of that um, because I, I don't think there's enough of it out there. Um, in terms of you know, resources for educators, that is my long-term plan. I would like to be able to develop something that educators can use to start incorporating this with their, um, their students. Um, there are some resources out there. Um, for example, John Lamb's book, The Anatomy of Drumming, is great. Um, there are some articles, uh, I co-wrote an article with my grad student Dylan, who is a uh, certified athletic therapist, about addressing and managing some of the more common um, playing-related musculoskeletal disorders. That's on the Drumio beat, um, so you can, you can go to that. Actually, I think I do, yeah, my link tree up here, if you go there, the, there's links to that article as well. But I do hope at some point to roll out some kind of resource that will make it easier for teachers to, to do this. Thank you. Isabel, you have questions? Yeah, well, I'm looking on the people uh, around the world. <laughs> okay, so, um, sorry. So, the first question uh, was, uh, do you have any plans to extend this work to other instruments? Not, not at the moment, no. Um, not because I don't think it's important, because I really do. Um, but there's so little work done in percussion in general and drummers specifically that in an effort not to spread myself too thin, I'd like to focus on, on one particular group. <clears throat> However, I know that there is more work that's been done, uh, I believe on pianists and violinists. Um, there seems to be a bigger body of knowledge for those two groups, um, but I myself haven't dived into that quite yet. Okay, another question. This was from Andrea Creech. Now I have a question from uh, Christine Goptail. Given that rock musicians, sorry, make a lot of their income while on tour, and tours tend to be very intense in terms of playing time and travel with little time for conditioning and rest, mm. <laughs> have you discussed with your participants about how the business of touring could be modified to better support the health of drummers? Um, you know, that conversation has come up several times. And in fact, many of the professional drummers that I've worked with have told me that they work out on an almost daily basis, whether it's going for a run or uh, one group in particular, their entire band, they, they bring like weights and battle bands and stuff out on tour with them and set it up in one of their trailers as this like sort of makeshift gym and they work out every day as a band. Um, so I, I think people are finding ways to incorporate it. It is a challenge, especially when you think about things like, you know, riding all night on a bus and getting no sleep and then having to you know, grab a couple hours in a hotel before you go to interviews and sound check and all those kind of meet and greets and what have you. It is very challenging. Um, I'd be interested to talk to more of them now touring in the age of COVID-19 because a lot of the things like meet and greets are no longer part of the package for obvious reasons. So I wonder if that has freed up more time for them to be able to engage in these, and if any of them have taken that opportunity to do that, um, but I haven't had a chance to ask them about that yet. But that is a great question and definitely a consideration. So maybe one last question either from the hall or from uh, the chat, but we have a session with Nadia tomorrow at 9.30, I think, if I remember correctly. Yes. Okay, uh, so, uh, okay. So would you like to go uh, 
Okay. Uh, so, uh, are there recommendations for the spatial arrangement of the different instruments during the kit setting? Mm -hmm. Do you think that this would reduce some of the risk factors? So, there was a study out of, I believe it was the Philippines, where they, they kind of looked at that and said, you know, if, if we take what we know about reach envelope for setting up an industrial task or an office layout and apply that to a, to a drum set, what does that look like? Um, I would say, I mean, and I don't know those numbers off the top of my head, but there's no, there's no hard and fast, like you should have your drum, your, your ride cymbal at this height because everyone's body is different. So what works well for me for placement will not work at all for somebody who is six foot five. Um, so it very much depends on, on yourself um, and, and your own, like the number of items you use and what you use most often. Um, so general guidelines would be things like keep the things that you use most often in closer to you so that you don't have to reach really often. Um, you can have something way out here if it's something that you don't use, you know, you only use it two or three times a show. A big reach like that's not that big of a deal. You don't want to be putting, you know, your ride symbol all the way out there and having to have this, you know, really long reach all the time. Um, so, yeah, there, there aren't any specific guidelines just yet. Um, but I'm again, part of what we're trying to do is take what we know from the industrial world and apply it to drummers. So hopefully soon. <laughs> Thank you. What last question? I mean, that's uh, certainly... Uh, would, just, oh, sorry, just you have to... Yeah, very quickly. <laughs> so the question is about the a comparison with professional orchestras in Europe, for example, in the classical world, where most often uh, the service positions are doubled, so that there's one playing while the other one is studying, or they can alternate if there's a long tour. And, and so the question is, like, do you see something of this model that could be applied in, in the case of drummers? I mean, theoretically, yes, that would that would help a lot because you'd be getting a break. You know, if, you, if you're playing, if you're on tour and you're playing five shows a week, if you alternated drummers, that's only two or three shows per week each. From a business standpoint, <laughs> probably not. <laughs> it, that, that would be very difficult. Um, but I do know, I mean, it would be interesting because I do know, you know, we, we've seen it with, again, with COVID-19 where a drummer gets sick, and so someone comes in as a stand-in for a few shows until they're done their quarantine. So could something like that apply where, you know, a drummer's like, you know, I'm, I'm really, I'm starting to feel something in my shoulder, I need a couple days of rest, and so they bring in someone for two or three shows. Um, that could be something that works, potentially, but yeah, that, that would be a really interesting challenge to, to integrate something like that into typical, you know, rock pop touring. But it's a good idea. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Thank you for your most exciting presentations. And uh, thank you for everyone who was watching and who will watch in the future. The, the recording is on for one week, I believe, on the ISPS website. Thank you again. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you, Aaron. And uh, next session starts in 30 minutes, I believe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.